So, Simon, one of the recent things that's been uh, interesting on the open source front is the uh, Digitech patent case. Yes. So that news came up uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first time in the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit that uh, a case had used the uh, Alice v. CLS Bank finding of the Supreme Court as a precedent for determining a patent case. And let's step back a bit. What was so important about Alice? So, uh, the software patents aren't truly a settled part of law. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, are mainly exist because of uh, precedents that come about from earlier cases. And one of the important precedents was a case called Alice v. CLS Bank. Um, Alice Corporation is a, uh, a, a, a patent holder uh, and they licensed some software to companies under their patent. CLS Bank was a potential customer who decided to implement the software themselves without buying the patent. And Alice sued CLS Bank, and then CLS Bank countersued Alice, mm -hmm. and there was a complicated battle that took place between them. Uh, that case then went to the uh, Federal Circuit uh, Appeals Court, and uh, in a, a, a standard hearing, the Appeals Court found in favor of Alice, that their patent was valid. There was then a rehearing in the Federal Circuit Court on bank with all the justices in the Federal Circuit hearing the case, and they found against Alice. Alice then appealed it to the Supreme Court, and just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court found um, very importantly that the patents that Alice was depending on were invalid because they were not subject matter that was uh, able to be patented. Which is what we've been saying in the open source community for about 30 years. Well, it, the case is a little more nuanced uh -huh. because uh, what the Supreme Court found was it didn't matter that it was software mm -hmm. uh, that was being patented. What mattered was that uh, the software didn't add any value over and above the abstract method. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the court left open the possibility that there could still be software patents if they added significant value to the computer they were running on. But the court, uh, in the Alice judgment, very clearly said that the mechanism patent lawyers have been using to force through software patents, where they, they said this abstract idea is patentable because it runs on a computer. The uh, Supreme Court said that's not enough to make something patentable. Uh, just saying on a computer is not of itself innovative. And uh, to get a software patent from now onwards, you're going to have to significantly add to the function of the physical device with your software. Uh, and so that created then a very clear test that the Federal Circuit Appeals Court could use to test other patents. And a case that had been pending for a long time was Digitech. Digitech are a massive patent troll. Uh, they're part of, uh, they're a subsidiary of a, of a, a, a company called Asasia. Um, they have been suing absolutely everybody that was doing um, uh, digital image profiles for uh, patent infringement. And that included camera companies like Pentex and Mamiya, it included camera retails like b and and Buy.com, it included computer companies. The, the list of people they were trying to sue was an enormous list of people. And uh, the Federal Circuit this time said that they didn't even need to go and find out if there had been infringement because uh, Digitex patents were invalid using the Alice test of whether there was a significant improvement to the computer being caused by the patent. So this is great news, I believe, not so much because pat software patents have been crushed, but more because the Federal Circuit Court has now got a test that means they'll never need to go as far as finding out whether there's been infringement. They'll be able to stop early at the subject matter. Now, the U.S. Patent Office has also said they're going to um, change their rules for uh, granting patents. Um, well, the, 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 the legislative, legislative situation is really quite complicated uh -huh. at the moment. Uh, what keeps on happening is very worthy attempts to change the law or to change the process mm -hmm. that then get uh, scuttled by um, something behind the scenes that makes the legislation mysteriously disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happened a couple of times in mm -hmm. Congress now. And I, I don't really feel that we're in a good position, either with the USPTO or with um, the uh, legislation at the moment. I, I, I think we're, we've got a lot of good signs from the Supreme Court verdict on Alice, and I think we're going to keep on seeing that crop up with people deciding that uh, the subject matter is simply not patentable. And we may still be fighting case after case individually. I, but we'll still be doing uh, that. Well. Uh, We'll see the backlog of cases because the, the Federal Circuit slowed down while it was waiting for the Alice case to come out because they, they knew that um, 
if they uh, waited for Alice, they would then be able to adjudicate on all the pending patent suits using that as a precedent, and they would then not have the Supreme Court be faced with lots of reversals that it would have had to have done. Um, so there's, there'll now be a little backlog as we see these cases coming in like trains into a station for the Federal Circuit to find on. And then after that, I believe we'll see uh, the patent trolls uh, chilled mm. by this activity. I think they'll feel less that they'll feel less certain that they'll be able to execute on their business model because the patent trolls business model doesn't actually depend on going to court. Um, patent trolls depend on scaring you so much with the cost mm. of going to court that you settle out of court and that you sign an NDA promising not to tell anyone that you settled or how much for. And patent trolls depend on uh, being able to blackmail, being able to scare companies into submission. And what this now means is that um, uh, patent trolls are going to find that the Federal Circuit isn't finding for them, that the Federal Circuit could well uh, be willing to give costs against them. And patent trolls will now be a lot more cautious about which battles they pick. And the cases will also go faster, probably. Yes. Yes. Very important. So, clearly, uh, you have been not only a great advocate, but a, a great educator about free software over mm -hmm. these years. And you are doing this as the part of the Open Source Initiative. Uh, tell us a bit about the educational efforts there. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm currently president of the Open Source Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined OSI about five years ago. And when I joined OSI, OSI was all about licenses. It was all about uh, the open source definition and approving licenses. Mm -hmm. Now, those are still really important, mm -hmm. but over the last three years, we've been gradually rediscovering OSI's original charter, mm -hmm. uh, which included uh, championing the idea of open source through education and through, through advocacy, and also included building bridges between communities. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, over the last couple of years, we've been gradually spending time introducing individual membership mm -hmm. um, and introducing corporate sponsorship so that we then have the funds to have a very small administrative staff and begin to get new initiatives coming into the open source community. And the uh, individual membership is very cheap. Even I could join. <laughs> I joined up on the very first day. You, you did offered. Thank you very much for doing that. So yes, it <laughs> costs cost $40 mm -hmm. to, to join OSI as an individual member. We've actually just introduced a benefit for individual members, mm -hmm. which is um, there's a, a, a three-month subscription to the new Linux Voice magazine yeah. for all OSI members. And we'll be introducing further benefits. Where is Linux Voice published? It's published in the UK. Yeah, I figured. Okay. And I, I, I happened to write in it, so that mm -hmm. was. Uh, I persuaded the editor it would be a good thing to give free subscriptions to OSI members. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not really because we think people join to get those sorts of things, but it, it's good to to share those benefits with community members. And it kind of illustrates the way that we're working, which is to say, well. If the individual members and the affiliate members, which is non-profit organizations, and the corporate sponsors are able to help one another, we can cause good things to happen in the open source community that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So we've just finished uh, developing a new curriculum for open source called the Flow Curriculum. A, uh, a, a member called Joseph Potvin has been uh, writing that. That's been paid for by a corporate sponsor. So we now have a full, completely free, open source curriculum that educators can use as the basis for their own courses. Um, we've also, at OSCON this year, announced that um, OpenHack, the organization that helps newcomers get involved in open source projects, uh, it's become an affiliate, but more importantly, we're acting as its corporate sponsor. So we're handling their fundraising for them so that they haven't got to do that. And then I, I, we have several more projects in the pipeline that are going to come into our incubator and we're going to either make them a permanent part of OSI's work or we're going to help them to become mature and then uh, succeed on their own. This is a big part of what I think OSI is going to be about in the future. It's going to be a meeting place for open source where people are able to uh, find links between each other and do good things for the community that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Let's go back to the academic efforts for a moment. What kind of students need this kind of course? Like lawyers, technologists, government people? Well, uh, open source is now pervasive. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wrote in uh, InfoWorld this morning that we're in the golden age of open source. Mm -hmm. Open source is underneath everything. It's yeah. in everything. And what's more, the controversy has gone out of open source. Uh, you don't hear people arguing about copyleft versus Apache. You don't hear people arguing about business models. Uh, everyone just takes it for granted that it will be open source unless there's a good reason why not. 
and that means that every aspect... I don't think we've gone that far, but still... <laughs> I, well, I, right. I think it, now every aspect of, of mm. education needs to include an understanding of uh, free culture mm. and of uh, open source methods. So this curriculum mm. is the basis for an inclusion in many different kinds of courses. Obviously computer science, mm. but also any other course where open source is going to have an impact on what's going on. So I, I would imagine it being of interest in economics. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine it being of interest in, um, in uh, uh, engineering courses and so on. And open access journals affect every field. Yes. yes. That's also an issue. And uh, I know uh, you had a conference a um, year or two ago that I got to go to for a bit on um, governments and open source. And right. Governments are certainly an area that needs some education. Well, uh, things aren't as bad as they could be on mm -hmm. government. So uh, some, some, some other news that broke while we've been here at OSCON, the UK government has just adopted open document format, yeah. which is a document standard that was created by uh, the Open Office project and then by its successor, LibreOffice. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has come out of the open source world and is now impacting government work. I think governments are beginning to get the idea that um, open source isn't about saving money on licenses. It's mm -hmm. about having control of your own destiny. Mm -hmm. And realizing that being liberated from, uh, from lock-in by your suppliers is so important, I think is beginning to motivate a lot of governments. So we, the, the workshop you came to was in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We ran two workshops in Washington, D.C., uh, one that was aimed at businesses and one that was aimed at government. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that was aimed at government was attended by uh, legal professionals from across the spectrum of federal government in, in D.C. Uh, and we want to continue doing those sorts of things if we possibly can. But more importantly, we want to be a host for things that you want to do or the things that, that viewers want to do. Um, there's only so, much thing that, so many things that 10 directors can do. Uh, but we want to leverage the, uh, the, the reputation of OSI and the new funding that we have from our sponsors to enable members to do things. So we want to get groups of members who want to run training for government to come to OSI and let us resource them, let us put them in front of uh, the government officials, let them use uh, uh, shared um, uh, education materials. That's really the direction that we're heading in now. So the course you saw was, was a kind of a test. We asked the question, would government be interested if we ran, a, if we, we ran an event? turned out the answer was yes in a big way and so now we want to make sure that uh, our members can go and replicate that event. And do you have some interesting relationships to talk about with other leading organizations and um, free software? Oh absolutely. Course? So um, it's, it's, it's quite fun actually here, mm -hmm. here at OSCON. We, we have a, uh, O'Reilly has very kindly given us a booth on the show floor over in the, the non-profit alley. And we've been put right next to the Free Software Foundation stand, mm -hmm. uh, almost as if somebody thought that we might fight or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out we don't fight yeah. because um, probably the majority of OSI board members are actually members of the Free Software Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, we get on really well with our peers in the Free Software Foundation. Uh, we collaborate with them wherever it makes sense. So we, we have done uh, joint amicus briefs. We, we filed an amicus brief in the Alice CLS case jointly with uh, the Free Software Foundation. It was written for both of us by the Software Freedom Law Center. We've previously collaborated over other uh, public initiatives, uh, dealing with software patents, um, dealing with the patent consortium that grew out of Novell. We, we worked on that together. And I expect that we're going to find more ways to collaborate where it makes sense. We're very distinctive organizations. Uh, the mm -hmm. FSF is very much devoted to the, the ethics of software freedom. Mm -hmm. OSI takes those ethics as given. Uh, it's, it's not that we're not interested in them. We just assume that you have those ethics, and we give you pragmatic, practical ways to express and work through them. And I think that makes the two organizations very complementary. Well, thanks so much for coming and talking to me today. It's been a pleasure, Andy. Thank you very much.